uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Chairwoman Klobuchar and Chair Peters and our ranking members, Blunt and Portman, uh, for this hearing. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I want to thank you all for your service to our country. I want to start with a question for Ms. Mislova, please. Um, it's about a topic that I asked about last week. The Secretary of Homeland Security has the authority to designate events with national significance as national special security events, and these designated events receive expanded federal support for event security. Factors used to determine national special security event designations include the attendance of U.S. officials as well as the size and significance of the event. In our hearing last week, the former officials in charge of security here at the Capitol testified that DHS did not reach out to U.S. Capitol officials about designating January 6th joint session of Congress as a national special security event. So, Ms. Ms. Mislova, to your knowledge, did any Department of Homeland Security officials ever consider or recommend designating the January 6th joint session of Congress as a national special security event? Sorry. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, no. To my knowledge, no one at the Department of Homeland Security did consider designating January 6th as an NSSC. Also, to my knowledge, no one responsible for protecting the Capitol asked for such a designation. Right. But, the, but when, it, when we're talking about an NS, NSSE, uh, we, you don't need a request from the Capitol, correct? correct? You could have DHS could have initiated it. So what is the Department's current policy and process for designating national special security events? And were there any procedural issues blocking such a designation in spite of the growing evidence of intelligence available to federal security officials prior to the event? I'm sorry, Senator. I am uh, running currently the Office of Intelligence and Analysis for DHS. We have a small role in the NSSC process, but I am not uh, qualified to speak about the whole process. It's fairly complicated. I'm happy to uh, have Secret Service reach out to you, ma'am, if, if you'd like me to follow up with that. Well, I, I think it's really important for us to understand what the yes. processes are. We had, as has been pointed out, the Vice President, the Vice President-elect, all members of Congress in one location at an event where there was clear uh, intelligence that might turn violent and there appears to have been no uh, communication or effort by DHS to designate this in a way that would have uh, had this security that we're now standing about stood up ahead yes. of time in an effective way. So I would look forward to following up with yes. you on that. Uh, I want to turn to Ms. Sanborn now. Um, according to a recent report, the FBI has currently charged 257 people associated with the events on January 6. Of the individuals charged to date in relation to the attacks of January 6, how many were already under investigation by the Bureau? Ma'am, I'd have to get you the specific number, um, but I can only recall from my memory one of the individuals that was under investigation prior. And was that because the FBI is limited in its tools or capacity to monitor, charge, or arrest these individuals prior to January 6th? Was this a manpower issue? I'm just trying to understand, understanding, looking back now, what might have made a difference in charging, in being able to move against some of those individuals sooner? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's twofold. So it's the complexity of trying to gather the right intelligence that helps us predict indicators and warnings. And I spoke earlier about while there's a volume out there of rhetoric, trying to figure out that intent is very challenging for us in the intel community because it happens on private comms and encryption. So that's one aspect. And then the other aspect is of the people that we were investigating, so predicated investigations, we don't necessarily have the ability to mitigate the threat they might pose by travel if we don't have a charge. And so I think you're tracking that we were aware of some of our subjects that intended to come here. We took overt action by going and talking them and trying to get them to not come, and that worked in the majority of our already predicated cases. Okay. Thank you. I'd look forward to following up with the FBI more about that. Uh, I also have another question for you about the FBI's information sharing practices. On January 5th, the FBI Norfolk Field Office issued a report that some extremists were preparing to travel to Washington and commit acts of violence. That report eventually made it to a U.S. Capitol Police analyst but it didn't make it to the former Capitol Police Chief. 
Mr. Sund. So I think it's important for us to understand whether this was a failure in information sharing policy or practice. What's the standard policy for disseminating reports like that? Yes, ma'am, that's a great question. I'd just like to segue into that, that part of the reason we were able to get that intelligence report from the Norfolk office is because we made it at a national collection priority for all 56 field offices to collect whatever they could on the joint session as well as inauguration. And so when they collected that information, they did follow our normal process, and I think we heard yesterday from the director, and went above and beyond that process. So they documented it quickly yep. within the situational information report, and they disseminated it three different ways, in writing, via email, verbally, and then also put it in what we call the LEAP portal, which is available to all state and local partners across the United States. So I'm trying to understand, though, how it didn't get elevated or communicated to the highest level. Who was the highest official in the FBI to be informed of the intelligence? So I, similar to Director Ray, found out about it days after. Um, and so I think it's very important to also caveat what that was. It was raw, unvetted information. And only because of the collection message did it get as quickly elevated to the Washington field office and disseminated to the task force officers. So thousands and thousands of tips come in just like this on every day, and not all of those get elevated to senior leadership. Except that this was tips about violence at the United States Capitol, where we were going to have all members of Congress, the current vice president, the vice president-elect. And so given the gravity of the threat, it is very hard for me to understand why somebody didn't pick up the phone. And I'd like to understand, too, whether any of the following were informed of the intelligence. The President, the White House Chief of Staff, the Attorney General of the United States, the Speaker of the House, or the Senate Majority Leader? Not to my knowledge, ma'am, and I think you heard the Director say this yesterday, and I echo it 100 percent. Any time an attack happens, we're going back, and we're going to figure out what we could have done better and differently. So I echo your – there's always processes that can be improved. Look, I, I will just say this, that uh, one of the things before a major event that one should always do is figure out who the leadership is, and they should be talking twice a day on the phone for the week leading up at least. That's kind of standard practice, at least in the states that I'm familiar with. It's certainly standard practice uh, for governors. And it is astounding to me that even if it's raw intelligence, uh, given what the stakes were on January 6, that that kind of sharing wasn't routine and that it didn't happen. So I, I hope very much that we'll, we will look back at this and develop kind of standard operating procedures so that uh, the leadership of security at the Capitol, the leadership of security in all the various agencies are sharing this kind of information person to person uh, rather than relying on standard um, emails and the like. Thank you very much. I will say that's the purpose of the command post, and but 100% echo your point, which is let's go back and figure out what we could do differently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. And for a member of the Rules Committee, we are following the order uh, set forth by the Homeland Security Committee, how they do their order. So if there's questions about that, that's how we're doing it today.